we'll, we'll hand across to uh, to Robert to learn all about Levin Down. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to this webinar on the lovely nature reserve of Levin Down in West Sussex. Uh, so I'm the uh, volunteer reserve manager. Um, I have been, I think, for about a year now. And prior to that, I've been a regular uh, volunteer um, for several years. Um, I'm not a professional ecologist or conservationist, uh, so I'm just really, uh, I'm actually an artist. And this is sort of my personal interpretation of Levin Down. Um, and uh, so I thought it would be appropriate if I started off my talk by showing you some of my artwork and how uh, Levin Down has inspired that artwork. Um, just a few slides to give you an idea about what I do when I'm not volunteering. Um, and then I'm going to go on to talk about Levin Down in general, give you some basic information for those of you who, who don't know about it or don't know where it is. Uh, and a bit about the, uh, what we're conserving, the habitats and the conservation that goes on on Levin. Um, and then I'm going to show you some of my favorite uh, animals, plants, insects and other animals that uh, I really love to see when I visit Levin. Uh, it's very much a personal interpretation based on either their beauty or their rarity or um, their extraordinary life histories. Um, so I've got a few photographs to show you of those. Um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, uh, what we do as volunteers and how we help uh, in the management of Levin. So uh, mm. let's get my screen to move. Ah, there we are. So this is uh, an example of, of one of my artworks that I did uh, this summer. Um, I came across these beautiful, fragile bellflowers here, and I just like the way that they were growing through this spiny uh, blackthorn branch, and I just thought it made a nice composition. So I went back to the studio and using the photograph as a resource, uh, I made the painting that you see on the right. Um, <clears throat> this is a watercolor. Watercolor is something I've just started using quite recently. Uh, I really enjoy uh, the process, the medium. Um, in the past, I've used uh, oil and acrylic. Um, so that gives you an idea of the sort of thing I do. I'm also very interested in um, painting the sort of micro world that we see that we see under our feet uh, you know if you look very closely and I like to uh, uh, paint um, subjects in the context of their environment um, for example this painting on the right here of the Bedagore Gaul or the Rob Robin's Pincushion um, which is a very familiar site on Levin on, on the dog roses and I painted the Gaul and then I've included uh, uh, an illustration of the actual gall wasp as well. Um, the gall, by the way, is the uh, chamber where the larvae of the, of the wasp um, spend the winter and then emerge as fully grown wasps in the following spring. Um, so I just enjoy creating a, a sort of almost like the life cycle of the insect. Uh, I also love to paint the birds on Levin. All of these three birds are breeding species on Levin. Uh, the Yellowhammer, of course, is a lovely, lovely sight uh, on a summer's walk and obviously a lovely sound as well with its uh, little bit of bread and no cheese song. Uh, I, I believe we have several pairs nesting in the blackthorn scrub. And Bullfinch, again, is another uh, resident on Levin and you can almost, on almost every time you, you go for a walk on Levin, you can hear its, its soft whistling call, uh, very much a characteristic sound on Levin. <clears throat> I particularly enjoy painting this, this male bullfinch. Uh, they're such uh, attractive birds. And then uh, the gold crest, uh, again, we have, it's quite commonly seen on Levin. It, particularly likes the yew trees uh, and the conifer trees um, 
that we have. <clears throat> uh, so also winter is a time that I enjoy uh, visiting Levin. Um, uh, there is al always uh, a lot to see whatever time of season you, you visit. Um, these are three paintings here were taken from um, uh, leaves that I'd found on Levin. And uh, it, some of the colors are really very extraordinary. You would think that these, maybe I've exaggerated the colors here, but they're very much representative of, of the colors uh, that I found. So, <coughs> so that was, uh, winter is, a, is an enjoyable time to visit as well. So Levin Down itself, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, it's uh, located six miles north of Chichester, uh, between the lovely villages of Singleton and Charlton in the East Dean Valley. Um, <clears throat> and here you can see that it's actually basically two sides of a chalk hill, the Eastern Slope and the Southern Slope, which you can see in the, in the photograph here. Um, it became a, a Sussex Wildlife Trust nature reserve uh, in 1981, the south facing slope. And then in 1988, the east facing slope was added. <clears throat> uh, it consists of 68 acres. So it's quite a smallish reserve. Um, but as you can probably see from this photograph, it's also quite steep. Um, from where you come in at the bottom to the top of the, to the woods at the top there is about a 60 meter vertical difference uh, in height. So it's really quite, uh, quite steep and very distinctive. You can see it looks very different to the surrounding farmland and, and uh, in the distance, the uh, wooded plantation. Um, now, there are also wonderful views from Levin across the uh, countryside, the West Sussex countryside. This is looking south uh, to that hill in the distance, actually Kingley Vale Nature Reserve. And beyond that, you can't see in this photograph, but on a clear day, you can see the Isle of Wight, uh, and in particular, the Culver Cliffs. Now, the reason I mention them is because, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, over the last few years, I think about 24 or 25 uh, white-tailed sea eagles were released uh, with the aim of uh, relocating them in this part of the world, in Sussex and the South, and the south Coast in general. And um, the reason I'm mentioning that is because occasionally one of these eagles will fly up the valley here and visit Levin. It won't stay very long um, because there's nothing much to keep them here, but it's very exciting when you see one. Uh, this was taken by a local villager, Martin Thorpe, uh, of an eagle sitting in an ash tree on Levin Down. So very exciting to see them. And it's wonderful that these birds are now uh, frequenting our skies again down here. Uh, this is just looking in, in the eastern direction towards the village of Charlton. And to give you an idea, that structure in the, on the horizon there is actually the grandstand of the Goodwood race course. Uh, I also wanted to show you this photograph because you get another idea of the steepness of Levin, uh, of really how steep it is, which is important, um, as you'll see. Um, so, yeah. So because of this steepness, um, it's never actually been plowed. It's always remained the realm of the sheep. And um, in fact, the name Levin comes from uh, the old English uh, phrase, leave alone, leave alone down, because it was, uh, obviously it was left alone, it was never plowed. And so uh, the sheep uh, have always, over many centuries, even hundreds of years, grazed the South Downs in general. Um, but ever since World War II, this, this uh, sheep pasture has become uh, much rarer. Um, and uh, it, um, the, uh, what we call the chalk grassland, what are you trying to preserve? I don't know. Right. Yeah, so this, uh, this habitat has now become really quite rare. And this is partly what we're trying to preserve 
on Levin Down. Uh, and the reason we're trying to preserve it is uh, because of its incredible diversity. Uh, it has a, an immense, uh, immensely dense and diverse uh, uh, array of flora and fauna. And um, in fact, it is often called the uh, European equivalent of the tropical rainforest. Um, in fact, there can be up to 45 species of flowering plant in one square meter of lowland chalk grassland. Um, so here on Levin, we have 285 species of flowering plant, uh, including 32 species of grass, 29 species of tree and shrub around the open grass. Um, and many of these species are restricted to this chalk habitat and found nowhere else. Um, so as the chalk habitat is disappearing, so are many of these species. So what I'd like to do is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, just show you a few examples of um, some of the uh, plants uh, and other insects and animals that I find particularly fascinating on Levin. Um, here we see three, um, the wonderful uh, clustered bellflower on the left, which is this very fragile, delicate uh, plant um, with this really in very intense purple color. Um, and Again, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a plant that's restricted to the chalk grassland. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it's, it's great to see it on a, on a walk in the summer. Um, there is a, another Campanula, which is more common, the nettle leaf bellflower, um, which is more common on Levin. But if you look more closely, uh, you can see these much smaller clustered bellflowers. And then this, this uh, carline thistle, I find, uh, uh very interesting um because it looks uh looks dead the flower heads look dead but in fact they're very much alive and you can see them dotted around the uh southern slopes and they have this sort of metallic sheen to them and they sort of reflect the sunlight and and so they're very striking uh, i just find them an interesting interesting plant and again they're uh becoming very rare um and then there's the round-headed rampion, which is uh, a wonderful little plant. Uh, it's known as the pride of Sussex, um, because really partly because of its, I suppose, its attractiveness and beauty, but also because uh, it's, it has its stronghold here in Sussex. Um, you can find it elsewhere in uh, some of the other southern counties, but uh, it really, it's more often, you can more often come across it here in Sussex. Although again, it's becoming very rare as the chalk grassland habitat uh, disappears. Uh, and this uh, fascinating uh, plant, the dodder, which I find very interesting on Levin. Um, it's, it's, not a, it's not a common plant at all. It's really quite scarce and it's actually a parasite. Uh, on other plants, it doesn't have any roots, it doesn't photosynthesize, its leaves are almost non-existent, uh, and it wraps these tentacles around uh, other plants. It's, it's quite often associated with heather uh, on, on the lowland heaths, but it is found on the chalk. And in fact, a survey was done um, quite recently on Levin uh, which showed that it, it was actually parasitizing about 22 other species of plant. Um, so it's, uh, it's listed as vulnerable on the red data list of the IUCN. Um, so that for me is, is a fascinating plant, uh, which I enjoy seeing on lemon. Uh, so I showed you the, I'm showing you this, not necessarily because it's particularly rare, but just because it's a, such a striking flower. Um, the stinking iris, um, this wonderful, it's one of Britain's native irises, and it has this wonderful exotic looking flower, um, it's beautifully photographed. Um, 
And then it has these amazingly bright red uh, uh, seed pods on the right here, which you can see from quite a distance away. Um, and so it's just a very striking flower to see. Uh, it, it's quite, it, it seems to like the shade under the yew trees. Um, that's where it tends to, tends to exist more often. Um, so this, I've, I've included these gentian, gentians because um, the gentian family is one of my uh, favorite flower families. Uh, I think partly because of their attractiveness, but they're also because of their delicacy and their uh, fragility, and in some cases because of their rarity. Um, so there's the common century, uh, which is was not particularly rare because it is found in other habitats, uh, other than the chalk habitats. Uh, but I just find it just a very attractive flower, these pale pink flowers. And it's amazing when you see it dotted all over the uh, slopes on Levin. <clears throat> the yellow wort um, is, again, not a particularly common plant, but it has these amazing arrow-shaped waxy, thick waxy leaves, which almost remind you of, of a cacti. And the reason must be that they are um, adapted to living in very dry conditions, which you have on the chalk. Um, so it's just visually, it's, I find it quite an interesting flower. And then the autumn gentian on the right here is found on Levin. I've not actually yet seen any on Levin myself, but I know that they're recorded there. And again, it's just a lovely, a, a lovely species to see. Uh, well, well, then, of course, we come to the amazing orchids. Um, we have several species of orchid on Levin, uh, including the first one to appear early in the year, the early purple orchid. Uh, and you can actually come across it in these little glades of uh, quite a few uh, in, in a sort of small area. Uh, really striking uh, to see that, to see that. And then these lovely triangular pale pink pyramidal orchids, which are again dotted around the slopes um, throughout the summer. And, and then the common spotted orchids, which is a very, very common on, on Levin. Um, and then this much rarer, certainly much rarer on Levin is the chalk fragrant orchid here. I, I think I only counted about four flowers this summer. So it's a much scarcer orchid, orchid uh, on Levin, but uh, it's, it's again, it's a lovely one to see. And then the last one to see uh, towards the end of the, the year to, into the autumn um, is the autumn ladies tresses, which is a wonderful, another wonderfully fragile uh, and attractive plant. I think all orchids are fascinating uh, visually, but also for their life histories. Um, I understand that, um, for example, the autumn ladies' tresses can take up to 15 years from, uh, germinate, from the germination of the seed to the actual um, flower, to the actual flower, as much as 15 years. So it just goes to show how fragile some of these orchids are. Now we also have these species which are acid loving, um, the heather and tormental, among others. Um, and so you might find that surprising to see uh, acid loving plants on levin. Well, of course, the reason for that is that uh, there is acid soil on the eastern slope, which I think uh, was blown down, uh, I think, in the, at the, towards the end of the last ice age. This thin soil was blown down on the northerly winds uh, from the glaciers and deposited on the eastern side of, of Levin. Uh, and so it's created a sort of layer of acidic soil on top of the chalk. And so you get this wonderful mixture of chalk loving flowers with acid loving flowers, such as heather and tormentil and several others. Um, and this in itself is another habitat known as chalk heath, which is also um, extremely rare and something that we're very much trying to preserve on Levin. Uh, now coming to the butterflies, 
Um, I'm also not going to show you all the butterflies that we have on Levin. I think there are 38 species that have been uh, um, counted on Levin. Um, so I'm just going to show you some what I think are some of the more special, rare and attractive species. I mean, there's a wonderful chalk hill, which uh, chalk hill blue, which really typifies the, uh, the the chalk, the warmer south slope. Um, can be seen all through the summer. Um, the male has these eye spots around the, the hind wings. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's just a, a butterfly I, I, I really like to see. Again, it's sort of restricted, I think, to the chalk heath, I think, isn't it, Michael? Yeah, it's, it's very much restricted. Um, and the um, diminutive small blue, uh, which I think is Britain's smallest butterfly, um, we have several colonies on Levin, um, very much associated with their food plant, the kidney vetch, and uh, the kidney vetch tends to be quite capricious. It appears in one spot for a while and then disappears and appears somewhere else. And the, the blue butterflies tend to sort of follow it. And so you get the colonies moving around over time. Um, but uh, it, yes, so that's a really lovely butterfly that I enjoy uh, seeing on a, on a summer walk. Um, I'm just showing these hair streaks. I've always loved hair streak butterflies. Um, the green hair streak is, uh, we see it very early in the year, as early as April, um, flying around uh, in uh, small groups around the tops of the shrubs. Um, I just think it's the most beautifully colored butterfly with this iridescent green underside. Um, I don't think you get too many butterflies that are, are green. It's quite an unusual color, I think, for a butterfly, but it's a, it's, I find it really stunning, although it's not a particularly rare butterfly, thankfully, because it is found in quite a few other habitats. However, the, the brown hair streak on the right uh, is really uh, a very rare, certainly a very rare butterfly on, on Levin, and I think has been a very rare butterfly in general. Um, and in fact, uh, brown hair streak hasn't been recorded on Levin for several years until I was lucky enough to see this, uh, this, uh, uh, this one um, this summer, managed to get this photograph of it. Uh, and um, so that's encouraging. So hopefully um, there is a, a thriving colony still on Levin. Um, they actually lay their eggs on blackthorn and the eggs and it overwinter on the blackthorn. Um, and I think one of the reasons for its scare, scarcity is because when the hedges, when the blackthorn hedges are cut, obviously the eggs are destroyed. Uh, but one thing I'd like to do on Levin is um, to do a survey to go and uh, maybe search for uh, some eggs and see if we've got a, a colony, a thriving colony on Levin. Uh, these are just a few more of my favorites. Um, the um, dark green fertility is, is not, again, not an especially rare butterfly, but just a, a lovely one to see. Uh, very fast flying, very skittish. It's very hard to, to, to see it settle. It doesn't settle for very long. Um, I was very lucky last summer. The, I was up on Levin when there had obviously been a, a mass emergence. And in the space of an hour, a half an hour to an hour, I think I saw 40, 30 or 40 of these butterflies flying around, and freshly emerged, which was very nice. Uh, and then the brimstone, of course, is a, a commonly seen butterfly, but it's very much a speciality on Levin, feeding on the um, buckthorn uh, bushes. Lovely butterflies to see. One of the few butterflies that rests with its wings closed. I think. And the marbled white is, again, it's one of my favorites. I just really love seeing it floating around in the, in the grassland in the summer. Um, its population seems to fluctuate from year to year. Some years there's plenty of them and other years not quite so many. Uh, there are also uh, loads of other fascinating insects uh, on Levin. Um, 
I've just shown you some of the more colorful ones here, the longhorn beetles and the nursery, red, nursery web spider, which is actually very closely related to Britain's largest spider, the raft spider, although it's not as big as the raft spider, but uh, it's a, a lovely commonly seen uh, spider on Levin. Uh, by the way, uh, just to give you an idea, there are 66 spider species on Levin. Um, 58 species of fly, 185 species of beetle, 12 wasps, and six ants. So there's a huge diversity of, of uh, insects. Uh, one particular insect that is really outstanding is the hornet robber fly, what I call the sort of beast of Levin, this magnificent fly, beautifully photographed by Dorothy Rodefeld. Um, it's, I believe it's Britain's largest fly. It can grow up to three centimeters. And um, it is pretty scarce throughout its range. Um, it was at one point, it was estimated that there were four, only 45 to 50 sites in the UK where it bred. I think it's probably expanded into more sites uh, since, that, since that survey was done. Um, but it's a, a magnificent fly to see uh, on Levin. Uh, it sits on the ground or low-lying vegetation. It's a, uh, and waits for its prey. It's an ambush predator, and it'll jump out at something flying past. And I've actually seen uh, one of them uh, carrying a fully grown um, grasshopper between its legs, just flying by. So really amazing creature. Um, now, there are also uh, fungi of all sorts on Levin. Um, I, I'm just showing you this earth star on the left because it's just such a striking species, uh, just the, the, the form and the look of it, the wonderfully, wonderfully named earth star. Um, and uh, I saw it, managed to get this photograph, um, came back a couple of days later with somebody because I wanted to show it to them and it did sort of disappeared, dissolved back into the, back into the ground. So they're very fleeting things, these fungi. Um, and then yesterday uh, I was on Levin um, and I noticed this, I, I've got no idea what it is. Uh, if somebody knows what that is, I'd love to know. But just uh, on, a, on, a, on an oak tree, branch of an oak tree, and it's just such a striking um, organism. I mean, I could see it it's a hundred yards away, you know, what's that orange glowing thing on the, on the, on the uh, oak tree, quite amazing. Um, and now we also have a thriving colony, a colony of juniper on Levin. Um, and juniper is another important species uh, which has suffered a huge decline in the Southern UK. <clears throat> According to Plant Life International, uh, some years ago, juniper, they, they reckon that juniper could be extinct in English lowlands by 2060. Uh, and it now seems to be <laughs> very much restricted to chalk grassland. Um, decline due to lack of grazing, leading to dense vegetation and the spread of scrub, and also overgrazing by rabbits on Levin uh, in the past has led to the failure of new uh, seedlings coming through. Um, but now I'm pleased to say there's, there's a really healthy number of, of, of young juniper coming through, through good management uh, practices and using cages and protecting the young um, seedlings uh, with, with little fences. Um, and so they're doing really well, juniper is doing really well now on Levin. Um, and in fact, I think Plant Life did a, did a, came to Levin and did a survey back in 2019, and they seem to be very pleased with the way, the way it's doing. Uh, another survey that I'd like to do in, in, over the winter is, is to go around and count all the new seedlings coming through. Um, it would be quite a fun, fun thing to do. Um, there are also other mammals uh, on Levin. Um, this is a photograph taken from a camera trap that David Harbottle bottle, um, placed on Levin. Um, and he's got an awful lot of really nice footage of the various mammals, um, such as these roe deer, 
Um, here's another one that I can show you that he that he has taken. Um, very nice to see. And um, badgers, and it's also got footage of brown hares, foxes, fallow deer. Um, so really quite a lot of mammal species on Levin. Now we come to uh, conservation of Levin. Um, and so what basically what efforts are being made to conserve this uh, important uh, chalk grassland um, habitat. Well, livestock is obviously very important um, to help to uh, keep the, the scrub at bay. And we've had over the past few years had Exmoor ponies, um, three Exmoor ponies, which seem to very, do a very good job of, of grazing the more vigorous scrub. Um, we've also had uh, three Sussex cattle uh, for, for a while, for several years. And then of course, the sheep, which have always been uh, um, a great benefit uh, uh, for the, for the uh, grazing of the, of the grass. Um, at the present, we've just got uh, only sheep, uh, approximately 50, um, 50 sheep in total, um, a mixture of herdwicks and Romney Marsh sheep. Um, and so it's an ongoing process to work out how much grazing you let the sheep do on a certain area and at what times a year and so on. Um, but alongside the sheep, uh, it's also necessary to use mechanical processes um, especially for this really dense, a lot of this really dense uh, scrub, which obviously the sheep themselves couldn't deal with, um, such as all this uh, very dense brambling, bramble here. Um, so uh, brush cutting contractors have been in um, cutting all of this. And we also had a remote controlled mower on the east slope, which was did a very good job at, at uh, hacking through the scrub and opened up uh, more areas. Now, um, the, all of these cuttings, uh, when they're brush cut, of course, they need to be removed from, from the grassland in order to allow the, uh, the, the plants and the herbs to, to grow through without being suffocated and so on. And so we as volunteers, we do a lot of raking and burning of the cut scrub. You see this whole area here that you can see uh, was very much like that, as dense as that brownie bit that you can see further up the slope there. And uh, so this whole area has been cleared um, this winter, which is brilliant because it's gonna be a whole new area of grassland growing in the summer. Here you can see another view, that whole area there was covered in very dense scrub and um, We've done a, a great job of clearing all of that and, and creating new grassland uh, for all these. Uh, it's gonna be very exciting to see what comes through this summer and what sort of orchids and so on. Uh, other jobs that we do as volunteers include um, crown lifting the yew trees uh, because the yew is poisonous to livestock. And so we have to cut the lower branches off to make sure that, that the sheep or the, the cattle can't reach uh, the ewe and eat the ewe and become poisoned. So that's a, a, a good job. And we have to burn everything on site, obviously, because we can't take it off. Uh, and another thing we do is uh, clear out the scrub from the juniper trees. Um, this is quite a quite a fun job. It's a sort of gardening job of clearing out the bramble and the hawthorn and the dogwood uh, to give the, the, the juniper space to breathe and to get the light in so that they can grow healthily. Um, 
We also, of course, do a lot of path clearing in summer and winter. Uh, there are two public footpaths through Levin uh, and they need to be kept clear. So we do a lot of, uh, of that sort of work. And we also do, we create what we call scallops, uh, which is sort of cutting into the more denser scrub to create these, these sort of open areas and to provide shelter for invertebrates and reptiles and orchids and all that kind of thing. Um, so that's quite an important job. Um, and then there's a lot of there's a lot of monitoring of wildlife that goes on on Levin. Um, the uh, there are volunteers who carry out regular surveys of various sorts. Um, there's a regular butterfly transect that Dorothy uh, and Chris have been doing for many years, I think, um, in the but during the whole during the season, going out once a week on a on a on a particular route known as a transect, and recording all of the butterflies that, that they see. And so they built up a, a huge uh, database of important information about the, the status of butterflies on Levin. Um, there is also a small uh, hazel woodland on Levin, um, which has had uh, a good population of dormice in the past, although we're not at the moment too sure about the status of the dormice. Um, I, I believe the last survey that was carried out didn't didn't find any presence of dormice although there are quite a few we have quite a few boxes dormice boxes in the woods um there's another survey going to be carried out uh i think quite soon and so hopefully we'll find more presence of dormice now it's always fun uh for me to when i'm walking around living levin to discover new things that I haven't seen before, and occasionally things that actually haven't been recorded on Levin before. Uh, uh, one example is this nest on the left here. Um, one of the volunteers was raking cuttings on the south slope and found this nest, which actually had a bumblebee, a bumblebee flew out of it. But it turns out it's actually a harvest mouse nest uh, and um, harvest mice have not been recorded on Levin before. So, it was uh, very nice to find this, um, and it remains to be seen whether there is a, 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 a good colony of harvest mice on the reserve. I hope there is. Um, we're going to do hopefully do some more um, surveying for harvest mice. And this uh, this uh, woolly caterpillar, woolly bear as it's called, um, I found, and it turns out to be the caterpillar of the garden tiger moth which was a nice thing to find on Levin, it hadn't been recorded before. Uh, and it's, I think it's, it's quite declining in, in numbers generally as well. So it's always, it's always fun to find, find new things and there's always something new to see on Levin. Um, so going back to volunteering, yes, it's a, it's a, we do have a, a, an enjoyable day. It's good exercise, uh, making a good contribution to conservation. Uh, it's fun. There are great views uh, to, to be seen while, while we're having our lunch. Um, and so if you're interested in volunteering, of course, you'd be very welcome to come along and please contact the, the trust. So um, coming to the end now, just to sort of conclude, um, Levin is it's interesting because Levin is sort of a bit of an isolated gem. It's a bit of an oasis, a bit of a seed bank surrounded by farmland um, and improved grassland. Um, and it's it'd be nice if in the future, some of this diversity on Levin might extend out towards across the wider countryside rather than just being contained in a, in a small area. Um, so uh, it's very important to manage and maintain uh, these, uh, this increasingly precious ecosystem um, for the future. Um, now I've actually come to the end of my uh, talk. I don't know how long that was, whether that was 
roughly. You're spot on. You're spot on yeah. for time. Is it? Is it spot on? That was that was perfect. About forty minutes, wasn't it, Sophia? I yeah. think I, I missed a bit out, unfortunately, but. That was fine. Absolutely perfect. Thank you. I didn't, I didn't describe the, the habitat as well as I was hoping to. The chalk uh, graph. That was, uh, that was fantastic, Rob. Thank you for that. I've got, um, I've got some questions. So are you okay if I read some questions out? I've got my big list of questions here. Look. Uh, uh, yes, of course. Now there's a few, before we start, a few people, um, uh, that, that fungi, you, the... Oh, right, does somebody know what it is? Yeah, well, actually, it's, uh, it's yellow brain, yellow brain fungi. Now, uh, uh, Alison and John got yellow brain fungi. Julia and her husband had a bit of a debate about it, but actually Julia's husband was right. It was yellow brain fungi. So, but my my yeah. wife would tell me you can't call it yellow brain fungi because there's like there's three or four different species are very similar. You need to look, look at the spores under a microscope. But my yeah. wife's not here tonight, so it's yellow brain <laughs> fungi. So we'll, we'll call it that. Yeah, yellow John John got it right as well. Yeah, Someone yeah. else got the family from their ID yeah. fungi. I mean, is it quite common? I've never seen it. Before. Yeah, you see it. You see it in the winter, certainly. But it's, uh, it's it's so striking. It really sort of stands amazing, out. So, uh, amazing, yeah, yeah. Look yeah. at. Um, so, I've got some questions. Um, uh, what? Uh, Caroline just asked. So you mentioned about the volunteers. What days of the week do you do voluntary work? I actually think Caroline may be quite keen on coming along? Well, um, there are several different groups, volunteer groups. Um, the one that I sort of oversee is on Sundays. Uh, it's the second and four, uh, fourth Sunday of every month. Um, but there's also uh, a group known as the Hit Squad, which I believe go out um, on Wednesdays, not specifically to Levin, to other reserves as well. And there is a Saturday group as well that, that comes to Levin. Um, I'm not sure how frequently, um, but the one I the one I'm sort of involved with is is the Sunday Sunday one. Okay, yeah. so yeah, if you go onto the uh, the Wildlife Trust website, there's a whole volunteer section there. You can, uh, if people do want to yeah. join uh, Rob and his team up there, then uh, that's the way to do it. And also, quite a few people seem to want to, want to sort of visit uh, Levin. What's the best way of to get access? There? I mean, is there there's, well, is there sort of car parking in the area? Yes, there is. There's a lay-by in the just on the edge of the village of Charlton, where you can um, pull in. There's, there's room for several cars to pull in, or there's also room uh, a bit further up the lane. So yeah, there there is there is parking uh, near the near the Charlton entrance, and then um, you can also park at the single en uh, Singleton entrance, but that is uh, during the week. That's quite busy because there's a school there. Um, and but at the weekends, that you can park at that end and come from the Singleton end as well, which is the western end. Um, and I guess there's uh, there's bus services going. Up uh, to well, the bus services. Yeah, the, yeah, exactly. The bus services that go from Ch Chichester to Singleton. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, okay now. Uh, Bruce asks, so what is your favorite month to visit Levin Down? Well, uh, I think it's got to be, um, I think it's got to be one of the summer months, probably June. Yeah, probably June, you know, where, you, where you've got the most kind of wealth of diversity, particularly on the, um, on the south, warmer south slope, where you've got all the, you know, lots of orchids coming through. Butterflies seem to be at their, you know, most dense in terms of numbers. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think def definitely there's so much life going on in the summer. You know, you can just sit down on the turf and just watch so much stuff going on, you know, in a, on a sort of micro level, you know, insects and invertebrates. And, and then the mosaic of colour as well is great. Yeah. Sounds lovely. It's been great watching these slides on a... Quite a, quite a bleak, uh, a big January day to see, see the blue sky and butterflies there. It's been it's been lovely this evening. So, yeah. um, and uh, Peter asked, what times of year are the are the sheep grazing up on the uh, Levin Down? Well, they, 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 they tend to graze the sheep um, during the winter. Um, I keep getting this thing coming up on my screen. Oh yeah, don't that's worry. Me. I'm annoying oh, you so, with questions. Right. Uh, well, yeah, they tend to graze the sheep in the winter. Um, uh, and I mean, for example, they have been grazing them for the last several months, um, but they're now no longer there. I believe they're coming back. Um, I'm not really too up on on the sort of grazing regime. Uh, you yeah, know, to be honest. I was going to say there was quite a few questions on grazing. Michael came through, wasn't there? And I think since it's such a popular topic, I will get our grazing manager Tom Parry 
exactly talk. yeah come and do a talk on it in more detail exactly yeah they they know exactly what what they're doing yeah keep an eye out for that one coming yeah. up fantastic yeah. well and two more questions here one uh one from alan uh are there adders up on uh levin down yeah. yeah yeah there are yeah yeah i've seen um I've seen adders on several occasions in various parts of the reserve. They're really, they're quite hard to find. You, you don't see them that often. I don't know whether that's because there are just not that many of them or because they're um, just very good at sort of moving away before you come. But uh, yeah, I, I, I love adders. I think that I always get very excited when I see one um, running through the grass. Yeah, yeah. Okay, there's one more question here. It says your nursery web spider looked as if it had seven legs. Uh, was it a deformed spider or just photographed at an odd angle? Now, I would normally say that's a daft question, seven legs. but it's, it's actually from my mother-in-law, I just noticed. So, uh, so it's a very good question, <laughs> fantastic question. Uh, was it a deformed spider or was it just a strange photo? You know that they, the, their front legs, they hold, the two front legs, they hold together, you know. Um, yeah, so yeah. It may, it may have looked like one leg, but it was actually, too. I, I haven't. I haven't got the photograph in front yeah, of me. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure how much of an expert my mother-in-law is on arachnids, but uh, I'll. Uh, we'll, we'll look at that photo later on. We'll find out if it was a a spider that had just been in a bit of a accident or something with a with a lawnmower. Yeah, I didn't. I honestly didn't notice that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, that's great. Well, I'm going to I'm going to hand you over to uh, Sophia, but uh, I'll just say my thanks and thank thank you, Robin. And thank you especially. Uh, for keeping the power on uh, through the whole uh, 45 minutes because well, I was really quite anxious. Yeah, the whole yeah that was touch and go. Lights didn't go out, so that was fantastic. But I'll hand over to, hand over to Sophia now. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank, uh, thank you so much, Robert. That was so interesting. And it was really good to find out from that poll that people are really loving um, reserve-specific webinars. So we'll definitely do a lot more of those as well as a grazing webinar as well. Um, yeah. So we can learn more in detail. Um, thank you all so much for being here.